Good morning. Does everybody have a copy of the notes? Yes. No. Yes. If you don't have one, uh, they're on the table in the back. All right. Um, if you would look at your, before we get started, uh, going through the lesson for today, um, you know, I get emails and I don't always say things to people about them. But I got I got an email this week from a lady regarding this class, and I wanted to to share it with you. I'm not going to tell you her name because I didn't ask her if I could, but I'm going to read from it. She says, "Dear Brian, I just wanted to tell you what a huge blessing your series has been for me. And so it's like a weight has dropped from my shoulders. I really needed to learn about the history of the apostasy from the Pauline doctrine." to be able to truly trust Mid-Acts teachers. Hmm. She says, I was raised in the Church of Christ, which is founded by a heretic who claimed to have discovered lost apostolic teaching. So I'm pretty leery when someone claims to be the one with the real truth that was lost but now is found. And then I responded to her, and she said, I asked her you know, what it was that really opened her eyes, and she said, the real eye-opener for me was your explanation of the apostasy from Pauline doctrine even while Paul was still alive. I had never viewed those verses in 1st and 2nd Timothy in that light, in part because Minnex dispensationalism is, dispensationalism is rather new to me. It was crucial for me to trace the timeline of grace teaching to be able to trust that it didn't originate in the imagination of some man. You've made it so clear that the unique grace teaching of today originated with Paul, but was rejected almost immediately and continually by the vast majority of Christians. So, you know, I just want to share that with you because if that's what she got out of it, that's the whole point, right? Okay, so, um, and I want you to know that you guys are participating in something that's having an impact for people that just beyond the room right here in the class. All right, lesson 16. I don't have a PowerPoint again today. My parents were in town all week. I was extremely busy, and so uh, I, don't, I don't have one. I will try to put one together so that it can be added to the website later on. Now, Norm, by the way, if you haven't visited the website, Norm has all the videos up there. We have last week's up now in one, you can watch the whole thing in one window now, um, instead of four or five different ones. Hopefully that will be able to continue. We're not sure if they're going to continue to allow us those settings and so forth, but anyway. Lesson 16, the age, of Christ, the age of Christian Empire, the Pilgrim Church, Monasteries, and Missions. Today's lesson is going to sort of be a little bit of a a hodgepodge of three or four different things. Okay. Um, <coughs> point number one: thus far, as, thus far, we've been tracing the development of Christendom and its main proponent, the Roman Catholic Church. Consequently, we have said little about specific groups that stood out against Rome's increasing power. Now, the title of the class is "Church History: A Tale of Two Churches." Right. Mm -hmm. We've said almost, almost everything we've said so far has been about the emergence of this one church, the Roman Catholic Church, and how they, uh, how that happened, and how that they abandoned Pauline doctrine. And we have said up, up to this point very little about other groups of people who had always existed that opposed that. Okay. So I want to start to look at some of these groups, and as we move forward, we're going to continue to do uh, and talk about a few more of them. But I want to explain the whole the whole idea of the Pilgrim Church. Okay, the t the term the Pilgrim Church comes from the title of E. H. Broadbent's book, which is called the Pilgrim Church, and he offers the following explanation for what it is. Okay, so if you will look at your notes. He says, the union of church and state was at all times looked upon by many of the Lord's disciples as contrary to his teachings. But whenever the church had the power of the state at its command, it used it, it, used it for the forcible suppression of any who dissented from its system or in any way refused compliance with its demands. A great number through indifference or interest or fear yielded at least an outward obedience. There were, however, always some who could not who could not be uh, endued to do this, but who still endeavored to follow Christ, keeping His word and the doctrine of the apostles. These were continually objects of persecution. Now we've seen last two Sundays what happened when when uh, when uh, not Augustine, I'm sorry, when Constantine came to power. All right, we talked about the Edict of Milan, the effects of the Edict of Milan upon the church. Then last Sunday we talked about the Council of Nicaea in 325 and the development of the Nicene Creed and how all of that stuff was a departure from the New Testament pattern of Scripture alone. All right? 
now that the church, now that, that that power structure has been established with the union between the state and the church that is going to emerge, I told you that's going to change a lot of things. Now that the church, the, the church-state union is going to now have the power to to go after anybody who does not agree with them. Okay, and again, that's going to continue to cause changes within uh, the, the way church history is dealt with. And so, what what Broadbent is saying is that there were always people, there were always believers who stood against that system. Okay, now they did not believe everything exactly the way you and I believe it. Okay, I don't want to have any misconceptions about that. But they, they would have had enough in common with you and I to understand that that system was contrary to the Word of God. They did not understand everything about Pauline mid-ex dispensationalism. They did not understand everything about right division. But they did understand about justification by grace through faith. They understood that that system, that whole Catholic Roman hierarchy was anti-scriptural. And so they did understand some things that you and I could agree with. Okay? But there would not be total agreement uh, across the board. So point number three, during the centuries after Constantine, the worldliness and ambition of the clergy grew until they claimed dominion over the possessions and consciences of mankind and enforced their claim with violence. At the same time, saints in various places chose to suffer all things at the hands of Christendom rather than deny Christ or be turned back from following Him. As we have already seen many times throughout this class, the word heresy is subjective depending on who is using it and in what context. Many of the people branded heretics in church history are said to be such based upon where they stood in relation to the organized church of Christendom. We've seen this with Marcion, how they call Marcion a heretic. We studied some things about what Marcion believed, and I raised the question with you whether or not he really was or not. Okay? We saw this with Origen. We went through how Origen believes in you know, uh, uh, reincarnation, universal reconciliation of, all, of every living thing, even Satan himself. Uh, allegorical interpretation, denial of the millennium, and all those sorts of things, but yet they don't want to call Origen a heretic. Okay, so the groups you got to be, you got to look at who's calling who a heretic and for what reasons. Okay, because as soon as they are labeled heretical by the state church union, now the state church union is going to do what? Persecute them as aberrant or or heretical based on what this church state union is saying is true or accurate or orthodox, whatever term you want to call it. You know, we saw last week, remember we saw last week that the ruling of the Council of Nicaea regarding the deity of Christ, I agree with. Jesus was God, okay? And the four points of reasoning that they offered for that, I, I agree with it. The problem, remember, if you remember from last week, that we said with the whole idea of having a council is you don't have scriptural support for that, and then the council and the creeds that the councils write become the authority instead of what? Mm -hmm. Instead of the Word of God. Okay? So, second point from the bottom. Their writings uh, sharing the fate of the writers have been destroyed to the full extent of the power allowed to their persecutors. Let me just use an illustration here. It's going a little bit forward, but as soon as, the, as, soon as Pope Leo issues... Uh, the papal bull excommunicating Martin Luther. You know what else that papal bull ordered? The, the burning of all the writings of Martin Luther. So to the extent that that church had the authority, the power, and the reach to do that, they set out to do what? Burn everything that Luther wrote. Well, that wasn't something new that started with Luther. They were doing that for, for about a thousand years with anybody who disagreed with them before Luther. Okay? So their writings, survive, sharing the fate of the writers, have been destroyed to the full extent of the power allowed. Now, why is that significant? Well, if I'm writing something, and I'm labeled a heretic, just to use an example, and they go out to burn everything that I wrote, and they, to a large extent, succeed in doing that, and then the winners are writing the church history, meaning the guys who just burn the stuff, then they can say whatever they want to about me because they've done what they're best to try to do what? Destroy anything that I wrote. And so this is how things enter into the, the flow of, the, of church history that are not necessarily correct. Okay. Not only so, but uh, 
Histories of them have been uh, promulgated by those whose interest it is to disseminate the worst intentions against them in order to justify their own cruelties. In such accounts, they are depicted as heretics, and evil doctrines are ascribed to them which they repudiated, and they are called sects and label, and labels are attached to them which they themselves would not acknowledge. Okay? They usually call themselves Christians or brethren, but numerous names were given to them by others in order to create the impression that they represented many new, strange, and uh, unconnected sects. It is therefore difficult to trace their history. What their adversaries have written about them must be suspect. Words from their own lips wrung out by torture are valueless. Okay? If they get a confession of somebody to recant under torture, can you really trust that at all? No. Okay? Now, look, point number one at the top of page two. While all their beliefs do not jive with the views of mid acts dispensationalists, we can observe much more in common with these saints than with the church that's branding them heretics. Okay? That's a key point that you have to understand. I'm not saying that all of these groups would have believed and taught everything the way you and I believe it, okay? The way this church teaches it or the way I teach it or other grace teachers would do that. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that if you compare what the organized state church is doing with what these churches are doing, you will find much more in common and much more that you can identify with in what these saints are doing than with what that, that, church, that, that church of Christendom is doing, okay? So here's what I've done. For organizational purposes, we, can, we will consider only those pilgrim groups that fit best into the age of Christian empire between 313 and 590. Okay? So for the sake of this lesson, we're going to try to limit to groups that would fit in that, roughly that time period. And we'll briefly consider the views of each group. Alright? Now, the first group here is the Donatists. Now, I've mentioned them to you before. And I'm not going to read through this whole lengthy thing here, okay? I'll just summarize it. Because I've, I've, I've told you this some of, the, some of this stuff before. You'll remember from previous classes, right, that Emperor Diocletian issued a massive persecution against Christians in the Roman Empire, right? That, that, that was in force and he was going after and attacking Christians before Constantine. One of the things that was happening is they were being asked to offer sacrifice to the Roman gods and so forth, and any Christian that would not was, was going to be basically executed. So there were a lot of Christians that, quote, lapsed. Okay? They either under some sort of coercion agreed to do it or got some sort of falsified document that they had offered the sacrifice and they had lapsed. Well, in North Africa there was a dispute after Constantine came to power and issued the Edict of Milan, the, issue, the Edict of Toleration of All Religions in the Empire, there was a dispute about whether anybody who had lapsed under the persecution of Diocletian could serve as a bishop. Okay? We talked about this the last two weeks. One group, the Donatists, uh, appealed to Constantine himself to solve the problem, and Constantine says, um, it creates a controversy, but Constantine eventually rules against the Donatists, who wanted to allow somebody who had repented, whatever term you want to use for it, to then go and serve as a bishop after they had lapsed. Okay? And Constantine doesn't, doesn't want any of that sort of thing. Okay? So if you look at the, the statement here about the Donatists, you see the years there. This controversy, by the way, is not going to go away for almost 100 years until Augustine in, in around 400, in the early 400s. Okay, so the bishops of Rome. I'm reading at the end of that point now. The bishops of Rome and Constantine sided with the Catholic faction, which argued that a properly penitent person could serve. I got this backwards before. That's why I'm reading it. Could serve as a bishop. Donatist groups lingered until the time of Constantine in 411, who, op who openly supported the use of force to put down rivals to the church. So the, the Donatists do not agree. They do not think that somebody who has lapsed should serve as a bishop. Constantine says if they've done proper penance or whatever, that they, that they should. I got that backwards at first. I apologize. Now, the sub-point there about the Donatists. The Donatists rejected infant baptism in every form, while the Catholic Church accepted it. 
They would, not, they would baptize no one but adult believers at a time when every Roman Catholic congregation in Africa, Asia, and Europe was dunking or sprinkling babies. And the Donatists were killed in large numbers when they refused to submit to Constantine's ruling. Okay? So they, do they have a distinct, different belief? Now, are they practicing water baptism here? Yes, they are. Okay? But they are refusing to baptize infants. They will only baptize adults who have made profession of faith. Okay? So you and I would view that as a very Baptistic view of the issue of water baptism. Okay? It is not a Reformed view. It is not a Catholic view. It, is not, um, it would not be involved in any of those denominational traditions. It would be more in line with how, how a Baptist um, or, or some free Bible churches would practice or, or, or uh, do the issue of baptism. Okay? Um, they, they refuse to baptize any infants, only adults who have made profession. Well, that's what the Donatists, how they were doing that. Now, I want to be clear with you about the Donatists. History is unclear about exactly what the Donatists believe for salvation. This is the next point. In actuality, they probably remain a fringe of Catholicism. Okay? They were still probably on the fringes of Catholicism. But the Donatists are important, though, because they demonstrate the willingness of the church state, or the state church, to kill those who even nominally would not submit to their authority. Okay? Notice the timing here. This is all happening in the early, in, in, in between, this, the early part of this controversy is happening right after the Edict of Milan is issued. And Constantine shows no qualms whatsoever within, within about 316, 317 there. Now, the edict is issued, I believe, in 314 with, with sending the, the boys loose to go kill these guys because they're not in line with what the church is saying. Okay? You follow that? So, let me, be, let me summarize clearly for you. It appears that the Donatists refused infant baptism, refused baptism as a regenerational doctrine from, from what I can see. Uh, so it's somewhat fuzzy though, and it's also unclear exactly what they were teaching as far as how, how somebody gets saved. The reason I included them and the reason I said this is because they demonstrate clearly the willingness of the, the newly founded state church to go out and, and kill those people who don't agree with them. Okay? Everybody with that? you have any questions about that? Or anything we've talked about so far? No? All right. Right, they would kill the, the, the women and the whole family or anyone else. How would they go? Anyone, anyone who would not recant. I mean, the Catholics at this time, the, the state church was not hesitant to do any of that stuff. And they wouldn't be for 1,500 years. Okay? And would do it if they could get away with it. They, yeah, I mean, if they could do it, if they could get away with it, they would do it. Okay, next guy I want to talk to you about is a guy named Priscillian. Okay? Um, Priscillian was a Spaniard of wealth and position, a learned and eloquent man of unusual attainments. In common with many of his class, I should say who, uh, was able, who was unable to believe the old heathen religions, yet was not attracted by Christianity and preferred classical literature to the scriptures. At some point, he was converted to Christ and began a life of devotion to God and separation from the world. Only a layman at first, he preached and taught the Scriptures diligently. So here's a guy who is not a believer, is more attracted to uh, classical philosophy and literature than the Bible. At some point, he gets saved, and as an untrained layman, he begins to preach. Okay? Eventually, Priscillian was made bishop of Olivia, but it was not long before he encountered trouble from other Spanish clergy. Snoids held in 384, 380 and 384 accused Priscillian of Manichaeanism, Gnosticism, witchcraft, immorality, and labeled his followers as Priscillianists. Duly condemned, he was turned over to the civil authorities for execution in 385. The dominant bishop Martin of Tours and Ambrose of Milan protested in vain as Priscillian and six others were beheaded. Okay? Now, E.H. Broadbent records 
This event as the first instance of the execution of Christians by the church. Now here's the distinction here. This is the first execution of a bishop by other what? Bishops. bishops who don't agree with them. Okay? The Snoyd of Travers approved of Priscillian's uh, execution, thereby giving official sanction of the Roman Catholic Church to the execution. That's why this is significant. This was confirmed by the Snoyd of uh, Braga, held 176 years uh, later, all, uh, so that the so so that the ruling church not only persecuted those who had called Priscillianists, but handed down <coughs> as history that Priscillian and those who believed as he did were punished for holding Manichian, Manichian and Gnostic doctrine be, and because of the wickedness of their lives. <coughs> this continued for centuries to be the generally received opinion. Now, Guess what they found in a in a uh, library? The writings of who? Okay, so understand the church has executed him. They've accused all of his followers of being Priscillian for being Gnostic and practicing an immoral lifestyle. All of these things. Look at the next sub point. Remaining true to the form, the uh, the church executed a systematic campaign to eradicate Priscillian's writings, and for a long time, people thought they were entirely lost. In 1886, 11 of his works were discovered in the library of the University of Wartsburg. They found some of them. They didn't get all of them. Priscillian's writings revealed that the account handed down against him and his followers was wholly untrue. He and his followers were, were of high character and were sound in doctrine. He constantly quoted the scripture in support of what he advances and shows an intimate knowledge of both the Old and New Testament. Moreover, he maintained that salvation, here it is, is not a magical event brought about by some sacrament, but a spiritual event subject to every man's conscience. There is no special official grace. Laymen have the spirit as much as clergy, according to Priscillian. So what, now look at, what are we to conclude then? What did they say for centuries about this guy? Had they totally misrepresented resented him? Okay? So when his works are discovered and they're read, what, what emerges from the pen of Priscillian himself is something that is totally different than what the recorded history has said about Priscillian. Well, why would that be? Who's writing the history, folks? The guy, the winners are writing it. The winners are the guys that cut his head off. And want to suppress what he's saying because it threatens their teaching. Their power. And that's the big thing, their power. The main issue here is not, I said it last week, the main issue here is not truth. The main issue here is power and authority. Okay? The clergy... Next point, the clergy felt threatened by men like Priscillian because they saw in the ordinary believer that which assailed their peculiar position. The power of apostolic succession and the priestly office was shaken by teaching which insisted on holiness and constant renewal of life by the Holy Spirit in communion with God. The distinction between clergy and laity was broken down by this, especially when the magical working of the sacrament was exchanged for a for a live for living a for a yeah, for living a possession of salvation through faith. So why are they going after guys like Priscillian? Because his he's saying that there is no mystical benefit to these sacraments. And if the mystical benefit of the sacraments is taken away, then what is happening to the division that they've established between the clergy and the laity? It's gone. It's gone. So it goes back to what Ernie said. The main issue here is not the truth about justification. The main issue is holding on to that power and authority. Okay? Any questions about Priscillian? Now look, there's a lot more we could say about all of this, but you know, I'm just trying to give you, you know, I got the, the citations are there. You can go look at stuff up if you want to. The third person is a guy named Nestorius. 
Now, how many have ever heard the term Nestorian? Some of you may have heard that, okay? The churches which spread so rapidly in Syria and Persia in the Persian Empire were shut off from many of the influences which affected the Western churches by differences of language and political circumstances. Now, this is a key point here, okay? I'm going to just give me a really, really bad map, okay? But if this is Italy here, you know, you got Greece over here, you got the Black Sea in here, like this. This is Asia Minor, comes down here. This is North Africa, per Persian Nile River, Persian Gulf over here, so on, all right? All of this area is controlled by what empire? Rome, Rome okay? Persia is over here, east and outside of the controlling authority of the Roman church. Okay? you got to keep that in mind. So as things develop over here in Persia and Syria, they're going to develop without the influence of the church-state union that is in this part of the, of the world. You follow what I'm saying? Okay? So this is going to be able to develop in somewhat more isolation from what's going on. Therefore, the Eastern church is kept... Their simple and spiritual and scriptural character longer than those of the West. Even in the third century, there was no definite organization of the separate churches into one system, and the country was not divided into dioceses. There might be several bishops in one church at the same time, which we've already seen would be the correct scriptural pattern, and the churches were active and successful in spreading the test their testimony into new regions. Okay? So by 300. The churches in this area are still outside of what's going on where. So when, when Constantine gets so-called converts and he issues the Edict of Milan and the Council of Nicaea happens, all these things that we've already talked about, these churches at first are largely what? Unaffected, Unaffected by these things. Okay? And so they maintain, and one of the reasons is frankly language barriers. Okay? They don't speak the same language here. And so there's language barriers issues, which is one of the reasons. So they maintain what I would consider to be a scriptural integrity as far as what the local church is much longer than the churches over here that are west of them. Okay? Now, next point. When Constantine made Christianity the state religion of the Roman Empire, the kings of Persia began to suspect those in their own country whom they called Nazarenes, of having sympathies with and leanings towards the rival empire, which they hated and feared. As a result, the Persian kings subjected the Persian saints to over 40 years of persecution, resulting in the death of some 16,000 believers. So, the kings of Persia hate the Roman Empire. So when the Edict of Milan and these things are going on over here, the Persians immediately become suspicious of any Christians that are living where? In their lands, thinking they are sympathetic to Rome, right? to, the, to the Roman Empire. Okay? So they're going to issue a 40-year persecution against all believers living in these areas, and they're going to kill some 16,000 Christians as a result of this. Okay? Now... Circum next point, second point from the bottom. Circumstances in the West would soon have a great impact on the churches in Syria and Persia. Nestorius, a preacher from Antioch, was made bishop of Constantinople in 428. Despite his preaching abilities, Nestorius ran into trouble when he openly questioned the emerging trend to make the Virgin Mary an object of worship. Okay? Running contrary to popular opinion, Nestorius was accused of denying the deity of Christ by refusing to exalt Mary. Cyril <clears throat> of, uh, of, of Alexandria, a rival bishop, seized the opportunity to attack Nestorius and called the council at Ephesus to settle the matter. Cyril uh, dominated the meeting and condemned Nestorius before any dissenting bishops arrived. After much political wrangling, Nestorius was deposed and banished. <coughs> now understand, why is Nestorius called a heretic? Mary. 
Nestorius refuses to call Mary the mother of who? So because he refuses to call Mary the mother of God and worship her as such, they say that he denies the deity of Christ and label him Mary. <coughs> The only thing he does. You're, so you follow on that. How many of you would be okay with calling Mary the mother of God? Yeah. Well, she's the mother of God, but she's not a mediator. Calling Mary the mother of God. Who has a problem with that? I got a problem with that. How many of you have a problem venerating Mary? And worshiping her. How many of you would have a problem with that? Okay, you guys are all heretics. You just deny the deity of Christ. That's the logic they use to call Nestorius a heretic. Nestorius refuses to call Mary the mother of God and venerate her and worship her. And so they immediately call him a heretic and say that he's denying the deity of Christ because he refuses to call Mary the mother of God. Top of page 4. He did not hold or teach the doctrine attributed to him. And, and his exclusion, though nominally on a point of Scripture, was really due to personal jealousy on the part of the Episcopal, his Episcopal colleague, Cyril. A considerable number of bishops refusing to assent to the judgment pronounced on the Storius were expelled and took refuge in Persia where they provided fresh impetus for the spread of the gospel into the Far East. Now listen, the name Nestorian was applied then to all the churches of the East, though they did not, they did not themselves accept it, but protested against it. And they, were, and they were supposed to hold the doctrine improperly attributed to Nestorius and equally unacceptable to them. They were distinct from and opposed to both the Byzantine and Roman churches. Uh, and one of themselves wrote, they are unjustly and interestingly called Nestorians, whereas Nestorius was never their patriarch, nor did they even understand the language in which he wrote. But when they heard how he defended the orthodox truth of two natures and two persons, in one Son of God, uh, in one Son of God and one Christ, they gave their confirmation to his testimony because they themselves had entertained the same doctrine. So if may, so, it, so if may be said that Nestorius followed them rather than they were led by him. So when these bishops are expelled out into Persia, all the guys over here writing the history call all the churches over here what? Yeah. Nestorian. They call them all historian because Nestorius refused to call Mary the mother of God and therefore he reje rejected the deity of Christ. And when these guys, these guys over here rejected being called Nestorian because they didn't even know who he was. And once they read and knew, and knew who he was and saw that he was teaching that in one person he was both God and man at the same time, then they said, okay, fine. We, we believe that already. Well, before we ever even heard of Nestorius. And before some council in 325 decided it. You see that? So the, what, this council is just officially, if you want to use that term, determining things in 325 that thousands of believers in other parts of the, of the outside of the reach of the Roman Empire were already believing. Okay? Now, any questions about any of that? When did the doctrine of Mary and Mother God start? It starts in the mid to late 300s, okay. and it's going to really start to pick up steam. Uh, we talked about that. Last week's notes, I had the uh, council that, that made that official ruling in the perpetual virginity of Mary and so forth. I don't have my notes in front of me from last week, but... Um, it's one of the councils that happened in this period. Okay? So, <clears throat> halfway, down the, halfway down page 4. When the Eastern churches outside the Roman Empire came under the stigma of Nestorianism and were branded as heretics, this is hilarious to me, okay? 
the Persian rulers saw that there was no longer any danger of their becoming allies with Constantinople or Rome. So there was given to them a liberty greater than they had ever enjoyed before enjoyed. So once the rulers of Persia and Syria understand that these guys over here, who they don't like, view these guys over here as heretics, they stop the persecution and let them do what they want. Because they know that these guys over here are not going to sign up with Constantinople or Rome. You see that? So they're like, fine, go do it. They, they give them more freedom after than they actually had before. Uh, again, that same point. This was the uh, this with with the impetus given by exiles from the west who had formed a refuge among them led a further development of energy and zeal in preaching the gospel among the heathen round about and beyond them. Now, this is this is good stuff here. It was missionaries from these eastern churches that spread the gospel throughout Central Asia, Mongolia, and as far east as China. Archaeologists have excavated two Nestorian cemeteries as far east as Russian Turkmenistan, indicating a strong presence of the gospel amongst the Tartar race by the middle of the 13th century. Now how did the gospel get out all, all over here through Asia? It wasn't these guys here that took it, it was who? It was these guys. The so-called Nestorian heretics of the East are the ones that are going to China and Russia and Siberia and all over the East with the gospel. Okay? Now, unfortunately, folks, second point from the bottom, over time the Eastern churches succumbed to the power of the church state as they, as they increasingly look to bishops from the cities of Seleucia and Baghdad for guidance rather than the free working of the Holy Spirit within their midst. The subsequent introduction of icons into these churches weakened their testimony to the idol-worshipping Gentiles around them and destroyed their power to resist waves of Muslim invaders that would subdue the region. Okay? So, eventually, is this area overrun with a Roman form of Christendom? Yeah. But before that happens, this is a launching pad for activity way reaching far into the east as far as China, as far north as Siberia. Okay. So from these early examples, we learn the following regarding the Pilgrim Church. Number one, they resisted the church-state union. Number two, they resisted the hierarchy of the Catholic structure. Number three, they were labeled as heretics for refusing to submit to church authority. Number four, the organized state church would not hesitate to kill them. And number five, the pilgrim church was more interested in preaching the gospel than maintaining power and authority. Okay? And yes, there are typos in there that I did not catch. Some of you are laughing. Okay. <coughs> Now, before we move on, are there any questions about any of that? Yeah? Well, when they find out, like, in, um, uh, in 1886, when they find that, did then, what finds that, did they approach the church and say, what gives, or did they try and, or did they just let it go and print what they found? Did to they my knowledge, them? from what I've seen in my studies, the, 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 the Catholic Church has never retracted their their story about the stories. I'm sorry about Priscilla. Would any of the uh, like Greek Orthodox or any Orthodox churches that are still distinct from Rome, would they be any of the heirs of some of these folks? Well, the just by just by nature of their close geographic proximity, the Eastern Orthodox Church is going to have more in common with these, these churches of the East than, than the Roman church would. Okay? And so there's gonna, it's going to be a different thing. Uh, you ever heard of the iconoclast movement? There was a big movement uh, eventually in the Byzantine Empire to destroy all the icons in the church. And the Western church, um, you know, there, there, there's an old joke that Luther, Luther says that he, when he went to visit Rome as a young man, they had enough nails, they had enough nails from the Holy Cross to shoe every horse in Saxony. 
Meaning what? Everyone's all over it. There's another old joke that says 18 out of the 12 apostles were buried in Spain. <laughs> okay, because the whole, the whole Western church is overrun with the issue of relics. Okay? The Eastern Church, there was a movement in the Eastern part of the church to get her, to do away with those icons and stuff like that. But one of the reasons why eventually these areas... What's the, what's the dominant religion over here now? It's Islam. And right now, all these areas over here are dominated by Islam. Okay? Well, if you know anything about Islam, does Islam have any icons, pictures, whatsoever? No. Nope. So as the icons get introduced into these churches and they become more and more like the churches of the West and Islam comes in with its particular view on some of these things, that's one of the reasons why, and not to mention the fact that either you convert or it will kill you, that's probably a pretty good motivator. But let's face it, Muslims weren't the only ones to do that as we'll see in a minute. Okay? Alright, monks and monasteries. One extreme reaction to the church's newfound power was the rise in monasticism. <clears throat> the desert became, uh, became a haven for monks who lived in extreme poverty, even <coughs> only enough to stay alive. So one of the reactions to this church-state power that's going to emerge is the guy that just says, I'm done with that, and he checks himself out and just go lives in the desert by himself. Okay? Goes off to the hills, so on, and only eats enough to stay alive and that sort of thing. The most famous early monk was a guy named Anthony. Uh, we know of him chiefly from a biography, which is attributed to uh, Athanasius, the great bishop of Alexandria, <coughs> who was uh, key, key, if you remember from last week, in the thing against Arius, um, and which by its early and wide circulation did much to stimulate the spread of monastic life. Now, according to Lorette, there are three types, major types of monasticism. Okay, There's the hermit. The guy who just goes off and lives in solitude all by himself. How long is that going to last? Not very long. Okay? So that's going to lead to a second wave in the monastic movement called the modified hermit, where they possess individual dwellings, a cave, cell, or hut of some, of some shape or form, yet they were sufficiently near one another for shelter and for some sort of communion, okay? And then that is going to give way eventually to what you would call a flow-blown monastery where the monks live in a community where they were governed by a head monk and by rules like the Benedictine order and all that sort of stuff, okay? So there's sort of a progression here in the monastic. It starts with them just running away from everything and going and living by themselves by, by a hermit. Well, then that doesn't last very long. It's pretty lonely out there and you eventually start going batty if you don't have anybody to talk to, so then they modified it a little bit and did that, the modified hermit, and then eventually it's going to come to be, you know, the monastery or the abbot, uh, where a bunch of them are going to live together under a strict code of order and rules and so on and so forth, and, you know, Bene uh, Benedictine is uh, uh, the, the main one there. So, over time, as I just said, the monastery is going to emerge as the, perform the preferred form of monasticism. So at the beginning of the 6th century, uh, Benedict of Nursia in Italy gave a great impetus for the movement and his rule of life for the monastic bodies prevailed beyond all others. He occupied the monks less exclusively with personal, you know, less with this whole idea of just going off and being all by yourself and stuff like that, and turned their activities to the performance of religious ceremonies and to the service of men giving special attention to agriculture. Now, Mark A. Noel, author of Turning Points, Decisive Moments in the History of Christianity, takes a favorable view of the monastic movement. This is what he says about it. For over a millennium, in the centuries between the reign of Constantine and the Protestant Reformation, almost everything in the church that approached the highest, noblest, and truest ideals of the gospel was done either by those who had chosen the monastic way or by those who had been inspired in their Christian life by the monks. If we read the scripture in our native language, we benefit from a tradition of biblical translation inspired by monk Jerome. If we sing together the praises of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we follow the hymn writing monks, Greg, monks Gregory, and so forth. Bernard of Clairvaux led the way. If we pursue theology, we inevitably find ourselves indebted to the monks Augustine and Thomas Aquinas. 
Now I'm telling you, now is that a very high praise for the monks? Yeah. How many of you are uncomfortable with that? Why, Bill? <laughs> well, here's my fundamental point. Where does the Bible ever tell you to go build a monastery? Where does the Bible ever tell you to go build a monastery? The Bible tells you to build what? Churches. Local, independent churches, like you saw in Lesson 5. So this whole idea of a monastery where a bunch of dudes, monks, or women, nuns, go and live by themselves under vows that you can't find in the Bible is a totally foreign biblical concept. Now, do the monks do some things regarding preserving literature? Regarding copying of manuscripts and so on and so forth? Yes, okay? There are some things here, but I think to... I think to say that anybody that reads a translation of the Bible is indebted to Jerome is going way too far since there were trans many translations of the Bible that were made way before Jerome made his. Okay? Now, Broadman is very critical of the various monastic movements. He writes, A monastery, however, differed widely from a church in the New Testament sense of the word. So that the souls that felt themselves impelled to flee the worldly Roman church did not find in the monastery what a true church would have provided. They were bound under the rules of an institution instead of experiencing the free working of the Holy Spirit. These religious houses for both men and women turn, uh, during the dark and turbulent times were sanctuaries for the, for the weak and centers were learning was preserved amid the, amid the prevailing barbarism, and where the scriptures were copied, translated, and read. Yet they, yet they were faith, they were fruitful soil for idleness and uh, oppression, and the religious orders came to be active instruments in papal hands for the, for the persecution of all who endeavored to restore the churches of God to their original foundation. Miller adds... Until the close of the 5th century, the monasteries were placed under the superintendence of the bishops. The monks were regarded as simply laymen and, no claim, and, uh, and had no claim to be ranked among the sacerdotal order. Circumstances, however, in the course of time led the monks to assume a, cler a clerical character. Many of them occupied in the work of reading and expounding the scriptures, and all of them were supposed to be engaged in the cultivation of the higher spiritual life. So, they were in great favor with the multitude, especially as they began to exercise their clerical function beyond the confines of their establishments. Uh, jealousy soon sprang up between the bishops and abbots. The result was the abbots, that the abbots, to deliver themselves from the dependence upon uh, spiritual rivals, made application that they be taken under the protection of the Pope at Rome. The proposal was, jet, was gladly accepted, and very quickly all of the monasteries, great, should say, and small, abbeys, priories, and nunneries were subject to the authority of the see of Rome. So what, what, the, what he's saying is that early on when they were independent and they were able to come and go and do certain things sort of more independently, that there was some good stuff going on in the monasteries, but eventually they came under the direct rulership of the bishops, which were under direct rulership of the Pope at Rome. So anything the Pope said then had to apply where? To the monasteries. For a few good things the monasteries may have done, the biggest problem with them is they were simply unscriptural. Nowhere in the New Testament pattern for the body of Christ do we see Paul instructing men and women to hide away from the world. Rather, we see calls for believers to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. The true Bible believers were not seeking to hide away in some unscriptural institution, but were preaching in the streets of European cities under constant fear at the hands of the Roman authorities. Or they were going to China, Siberia, or wherever else they could go where people would listen to what they had to say. No, no Bible-believing Christian that's going to seek to follow the New Testament pattern that we studied in lessons 4 and 5 and 6 is going to go and hide away in a monastery. They're going to be out on the street corner. They're going to be out amongst their friends, their family, sharing and preaching the gospel. <laughs> Not hidden off somewhere in some secluded location behind a wall where they don't have to deal with anything. Okay? Jerome 
A famous monk translated the Bible into Latin using Origen's Hexapla as his text. And this helps explain how apocryphal books were included into the Roman Catholic Bible. Remember I told you that Origen had included the Apocrypha in the Hexapla? Jerome takes the Hexapla, translates it into Latin in the Vulgate, and includes apocryphal books in his text. Therefore, the Apocrypha gets lumped into the Roman Catholic canon as a result of this. The true text of the Bible was not preserved by monks in unscriptural institutions, but amongst Bible-believing Christians in local churches who were preaching it and dying for its witness. Amen. Okay. All right. We got. I think we got enough time to do missions. Is there any questions about any of that? Yeah. How accessible were the scriptures to the common people back in the third and fourth centuries? I mean, you couldn't go buy a Bible down to your local bookstore, and the printing press wasn't invented until 1450 or so. Uh, there were four, there were three or four early translations that were made into vernacular languages: the Coptic, the Old Latin, um, the the Syrian. There, there, there are a few translations that are done, but it's a good point. In large part, the, the scriptures are locked up to the average person. And even a lot of these monks couldn't even read the New Testament. So, so the people had to depend on the priests and bishops to uh, yes. not only translate or uh, interpret, but to read it. But they would not read it in the common tongue. If you went into the, if you went into the Catholic Church, the Mass was read in Latin. And it was until like 1952 or something like this. So if you don't know Latin, you don't even know what the guy's saying. And this is one of the key features of the Protestant Revolution. The idea that the Bible should be available and accessible to everybody in their own language. But that's the thing Rome does not want. Because if the people can read and understand the Bible in their own language, now they have the capacity to question the authority of the church. So there's a real push here, folks, to keep the people ignorant. Because as long as the people are ignorant, they can't question Ernie, the power and authority. Okay? Missions. You got five minutes to go through missions. Okay? As we have already seen, the Nestorian missionaries carry the gospel into China and Siberia while Greek Christians from Constantinople opened new frontiers in Bulgaria and Russia. In Europe, many Roman warriors were captured by the Goths. You know, Rome's constantly battling the barbarians and so forth. By the way, the Romans referred to anybody that wasn't Roman as barbarian. Okay? So in Europe, many Roman warriors were captured by Goths and were carried away as captives. Many of these people were Christians, who despite being slaves, preached the gospel to the barbarians and saw many convert to Christ. This is so prevalent was the gospel among some of these people that they sent bishops to Nicaea in 325. Somebody out now, this guy's name, Uphalus. Good. Commonly referred, commonly referred to as the apostle of the Goths. Mike, this goes to your point, invented an alphabet and translated the Bible into the Gothic language about the middle of the 4th century. Miller insinuates, Miller even goes so far with this as to insinuate that the Gothic people were so receptive of the Gospel that Eliaric and his Gothic warriors that sacked Rome in 410 were actually Christians. That they were more Bible-believing Christian people than the Roman Christians at Rome were. I don't, know that, that, I don't know if you can prove that, but that's what he says. Perhaps the most important so-called conversion in the 5th century was of the Frankish king Clovis. Clovis was a pagan warlord whose wife Claudette, or Claudia, sorry, was a Christian who constantly begged her husband to convert. Much like Constantine in his hour of military peril, called, Clovis called upon the Christian god vowing that if his forces won, he would become a Christian. On Christmas Day, 496, Clovis was baptized at Reims. So Clovis is a Christian because he was what? Baptized. Baptized. 
And that is in line now, again, with official church what? <coughs> teaching. Catholic teaching. Here we have another Constantine. Clovis found the profession of Christianity most favorable to his political interest. But it produced no change for the better in his life. His object was conquest, his ambition was boundless, his deeds were daring and cruel. From being, being only a Frankish chief of a small territory, he became the founder of the great French monarchy, and a guy named Charlemagne, which we're going to talk about in a few weeks, is going to come from Clovis as a descendant. How did Clovis spread his new faith? The entire population of Gaul converted to Christendom after Clovis issued the following decree. Knowing that those who do not present themselves with me at the river tomorrow for baptism will incur my displeasure. So anybody who shows up at the river with Clovis the next day and got wet is a believer, is a Christian. And if they didn't, the Muslims are not the only group here, guys, to spread their faith by force of arms. The Catholics did it, and quite often. They don't want you to know that, though. And last point. When kings came to confess Christianity, the principle of church and state led to the forcible outward conversion of multitudes of their subjects to the new state religion. Instead of churches being founded in the different towns and countries independent of any central organization and having direct relations with the Lord, as in the apostolic days, they were, they were drawn into one of the great organizations which had its center in Rome or Constantinople or elsewhere. Once you're the king, folks, you can get anybody to convert. Because all you have to do is say, you either convert or I'll kill you. And most people would rather live than die, so they'll do what you tell them to do. And anybody that didn't, they're going to walk. So you're filling up churches and cathedrals full of people who have never trusted Jesus Christ in His death, His burial, His resurrection as the only payment for their sin. They're trusting in the fact that they got wet in the river by a Catholic priest or bishop. Okay? You see what's going on? And then that group is the one that's going to accuse Nestorius, Priscillian, and other groups of being heretical and go out and with the authority that is now tied to the state church, they're going to go out and execute and, and they're, going to, they're going to deal with anybody who refuses to submit to their power and authority. Okay? Alright, are there any questions? Good. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> any questions? Okay. Appreciate you coming out, and we will continue this next week with Lesson 17, which will be primarily on Augustine. <laughs>